Good day and welcome to CFE Media's Virtual Training Week for this session on how use of digital twins for predictive maintenance can transform operations. We'll be joined by Ralph Rio, a Vice President and Senior Analyst with ARC Advisory Group. I'm Kevin Parker, an editor with CFE Media and Technology. Following our presentation, be sure and stay tuned for a live Q&A on Zoom that will begin at 10.45 a.m. Central Time. Today's presentation can provide continuing education credits. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RECEP at RECEP.net. A certificate of completion will be available for each participant to download upon successful completion of a test at the end of the presentation. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RESA. This virtual class session is designed for technicians, engineers, and managers who want to better understand how the digital twin concept is being applied to predictive maintenance applications that can be used in industrial environments to improve productivity. We'll focus on the challenges and issues, technologies, infrastructure, and applications involved. You see before you the learning objectives for today's session. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. Attendees are eligible for one PDH credit for this event airing on October 7th and is categorized within the technical health and safety categories, including core technical category or reset. This event is a live educational session presented on October 7th, 2020 and on demand thereafter. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Ralph Rio of ARC Advisory Group. Ralph has been with ARC since the year 2000 and is an industry analyst. He has been involved in many industrial domain areas and brings this knowledge base to his practice. During his 20 years at ARC, his research and well over 200 reports have covered digital twins, industrial IIoT, enterprise asset management, and other concepts and systems relevant to digitalization. Ralph holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's in management science from RPI, Troy, New York. Thanks, Ralph, for joining us for today's session. The floor is yours. Kevin, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, we're here to talk about predictive maintenance. Uh, and, and predictive maintenance has been around for a very long time. Uh, but in the past, it was a, a very expensive custom application uh, with a, a lot of technologies being chosen. Uh, and each time uh, a preventative maintenance application was developed, a new set of technology would be used. Uh, this made them very difficult to support and maintain. So not only were they expensive to develop, but they often were very fragile too. Would, uh, as soon as something changed around them, uh, they would break and people would go back to the old way of do th doing things. Now, the significant change is that new technologies that have lower development costs, much easier to develop the applications. They use a platform, so they're much more sustainable uh, and they're, they uh, last longer. Uh, and this has... Uh, developed into uh, a high growth area for the applications of uh, predictive maintenance. Uh, so th this presentation, we're going to drill into uh, the technologies for predictive maintenance, uh, implementation strategy, benefits, uh, and uh, uh, some conclusions. So uh, just a little bit about the firm that I work for, ARC is advisory group. Essentially, we're a think tank for industrial corporations, and uh, most of our analysts have had uh, operating experience. Uh, for example, I've ran a maintenance department early in my career, and we serve the industrial markets from the discrete manufacturing, hybrid manufacturing through the process industries, uh, including utilities. Now, uh, so I'm going to talk about my agendas, the digital transformation in, in maintenance, 
what are the benefits? And I'm going to go through all three of the major uh, segments that use predictive maintenance. Uh, and then we'll get into uh, business process and workflow to, uh, to make sure the benefits are achieved. Uh, and if time permits, I'll, we'll go into a few case stories. Okay. Um, smartphones. You know, these were invented uh, maybe 10, 11 years ago. And I, I have a, a list of items that you know, I looked at the applications I have on my smartphone. I looked at the things that that uh, were replaced. Then you see the picture on the right. That's not me, by the way. Uh, that guy's far more handsome. Uh, but it gives you an idea of the things that were replaced as a result of smartphones. And uh, the software in them, the applications, uh, general purpose device being able to replace a lot of hardware. And, uh, you know, the point of the slide is that you are next. This is starting to impact maintenance. And predictive maintenance is the key application uh, that uh, is affecting that change. The, the software infrastructure used for smartphones uh, has proven the economies of scale through consumer of lock, uh, electronics have made it less expensive. And now this is moving into the maintenance domain. So I'll just describe that in a little bit more detail. You know, we have a, a smartphone. Most of you probably have one in one your pocket. Uh, it has IO in it. The uh, location is a, is a key example your GPS uh, coordinates, uh, that information goes up to the cloud and uh, there are applications in there that do analytics on it, integrate it with other databases and downlines the loads to your smartphone, a map that tells you where you are in the world. Well, that technology uh, can be applied to your equipment like uh, the mining equipment showed on the bottom slide there uh, and also units inside your your uh, plants so there's sensors uh in these equipment the the readings are sent up the applications on the cloud some analytics occurred uh an alert is sent to somebody who can do something about the problem and that the most uh, common application happens to be predictive maintenance and i'll get into the benefits later into the in the presentation so at, at a high level Predictive maintenance today and the rapid adoption of it is leveraging software and infrastructure that was created via smartphones. Now, what's different between what we used to do uh, in the past and today? So in the past, um, basically there was, it was a manual processes using paper. Someone would print out a, a inspection work order an inspector would get a stack of these papers, go out, look at the equipment, record data, come back. Uh, someone would do data entry in the process. Uh, hopefully they could read the technician's writing. There usually was a lot of data entry errors. So you had low quality as a result. And uh, because it was a manual process and expensive, you had low data volume. So, uh, you know, Inspections and maintenance strategies were, were based on that were, uh, quite frankly, relatively ineffective. Uh, with with uh, automated data collection, uh, your data volume is high. And uh, if, if there's a, something wrong, typically everything is wrong. So it's easy to identify the source of the problem, fix it. So uh, very quickly, your data quality becomes very high. So with high data quality and high volume, that lends itself naturally to analytics. And those analytics can tell you when something's going wrong, which applies to predictive maintenance. And we see as a result of cloud and IoT, those technologies that were enabled by the smartphones we all have, uh, predictive maintenance is a common a growing application. So, why do we want to do predictive maintenance? Um, the, the, it, and this is kind of a short covery 
I'm going to go through this a lot more detail later on. But the, the key thing is to prevent unplanned downtime for critical assets. And typically, a critical asset is one that when it breaks, there's unplanned downtime with it. There's lost revenue. Uh, there's uh, losses of uh, work and process materials. Uh, usually there can be ramifications that are safety related, particularly in refineries, for example, where you're boiling oil, uh, and there can be an environmental impact. And this is just a quick summary in uh, some applications uh, where what are the losses? You know, it can be, in the case of the oil platform, $20 million per incident. Uh, in the case of a pharmaceutical batch, uh, that's a bioreactor there. And uh, if there's something goes wrong with that batch and they can't process it on time, the batch gets scrapped and that can be worth half a million dollars at, at times. And you see other examples in the slide. Preventing unplanned downtime is the key benefit of predictive maintenance applications. Uh, another thing I want to emphasize here is the cascading effect. I present this uh, because in this particular case, Duke Energy, they presented this uh, slide and a lot of others during uh, uh, an ARC forum a few years ago. Uh, what happened is a transformer uh, uh, caught fire. And that fire cascaded in the other transformers. And then that cascaded into the uh, turbines. Uh, that uh, generate the, the electricity and turned into a massive amount of damage. In this case, it was $10 million. And that resulted in four months of downtime uh, and the revenue that was lost due to that power generation. So, uh, you know, it, it can go far beyond just a particular asset that you are, are supporting with predictive maintenance. So, uh, Let's now bridge into maintenance strategies uh, and, you know, predict the maintenance being one of several uh, maintenance strategies. So uh, this is the common uh, PF uh, curve that uh, people uh, chart that people refer to. One maintenance strategy is reactive, meaning you, you wait for the uh, equipment to fail before you repair it. Uh, that obviously has some problems. Uh, preventative maintenance has been in an alternative. Now, uh, this turns out to be fairly expensive because uh, if you look at the recommendations that come out of the Nolan and Heap uh, uh, reliability study that they did uh, back in the 70s, I think, uh, and has become kind of the Bible for reliability, the PF or the inspection interval is one half the PF interval. So when a problem is detectable by inspection, how long before that causes a process upset, take half of that. That's how often you have to do the inspections. Uh, that is fairly expensive compared to predictive maintenance where you're automatically monitoring the condition of the equi equipment that's generated an alert and you then go do maintenance when it's really needed rather than uh, at these inspection, more rapid inspection intervals. And uh, the benefit of the predictive maintenance is that you get much longer time to schedule the maintenance uh, when the equipment is not normally operating. You know, that could be at another shift or in case of some continuous process plants, when you take the plant down for an upgrade or scheduled maintenance, you can do the maintenance activity at that time. All right, I'm going to talk about the improvements uh, later in the presentation in some detail. Now, this is key. You know, when I studied maintenance and reliability, I was trained for the bathtub curve. And that all assets have an early planned failure. And then uh, there is this long period of time where the failure rate is really low. Uh, and then as this stuff wears, uh, the rate of failures increase. And just to explain these curves, uh, this axis, the y-axis is the probability of failure, and the x-axis here is time. So as time goes on, uh, as, it, as it wears, allegedly 
the uh, probability of failure goes up. Well, these studies, United Airlines back in 68, Bromberg was a uh, airline parts manufacturer in Germany, uh, the US Navy, uh, by the way, these first two come at, directly out of Nolan and Heap. Uh, there are other reliabilities were studied, uh, were done after that was published. The U.S. Navy is for ships that float. And then the uh, U.S. Navy did another one for submarines. Uh, we see that on average, only 3% of assets have that bathtub curve that I was trained on and was told that all assets fail. That only applies to 3% of assets. If we look at all the assets that have an age-related failure pattern, it's only 18% of assets. Random failures occur for 82% of assets. So, so think about the preventative maintenance strategies that so many people do. That's only appropriate for 18% of assets because you want to do that inspection before the failure rate goes up. But if your asset has a random failure pattern, there's no uptick. So there's, the likelihood is that a failure can occur between inspection intervals. And really, the inspections do you no good at all. So, you know, uh, this uh, maturity curve was, a uh, model was uh, published by ARC about four or five years ago. And since then, I've noticed that most suppliers and, and people who talk about maintenance strategy has adopted it. And just to go through it, the, uh, uh, you know, as a result of your reliability analysis, some assets may have a reactive failure, maybe the appropriate strategy for it, where you just run the failure. Uh, some other assets where preventative may be appropriate, that's those 18% of assets with an age-related failure pattern. And we do that for the engine oil in our car. Uh, Condition-based is where you essentially look at a single value, data value, uh, and the example for your car is oil pressure or coolant temperature. Uh, and then predictive maintenance when you, it becomes multivariate typically, and that's uh, battery management for your electric cars is how that uh, happens. And prescription starts to give, uh, 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 in addition to doing predictive, starts to give the technician some guidance for how to do the repair. And we see that in the, the dealership level diagnostic equipment. Uh, and, and the way you get up above preventative is with IoT and analytics uh, for uh, the analysis to, uh, to generate an alert uh, when something starts to go bad. So uh, the, the key point of this is that 82% uh, of your assets really need one of these higher level uh, a analytics approach uh, to asset management. And that the preventative maintenance that people so often talk about is really uh, only a, appropriate for 18% of your assets. Now, as we start to talk about how you would implement predictive maintenance, uh, we have to talk a little bit about the data uh, because the, the, the data you acquire is, is obviously the foundation for uh, doing analytics and predictive maintenance. And there's, in general, there's talking about big data and small data a lot. Uh, uh, and we hear, hear a lot more about uh, big data, where there is uh, a large volume of data, a large variety of data. In this case, I'm showing things that could be PDFs as well as uh, uh, documentation about the assets and, and also the real-time data and historical data on the asset. Uh, and this is a, a lot of V, a lot of variability. Um, so where that has been successful in the uh, research that I've done is usually around uh, executive uh, KPIs and analytics to uh, drill down and understand uh, why those KPIs are going wrong and, and the offline analysis to go along with with that. And, and some people use it basically to find data, you know, where is that instruction manual for uh, uh, a particular pump? Uh, in a nutshell, it does not play well with predictive maintenance. What works well with predictive maintenance is a small data set. 
uh, in the four S's, uh, small, specific for a particular asset. Uh, tip, it can be slow. If you think of a uh, pump, uh, the, the parameters change slowly over time. And the data for a pump is, uh, as in, in the example here, is structured. So we highly recommend that you do not take a big data approach that is expensive uh, and it, it requires a lot of data science uh, and a huge upfront investment for the big data. If you go to a small data set, and you know I'm talking about maybe six data values for a pump. Uh, with that smaller data set, you really don't need data science. It's well bounded and the probability of success is a lot higher. So to, just to drill into this a little bit more detail, you know, in this example for the pump, uh, one could think about just six data values that would make for a very robust predictive maintenance algorithms. Three of them are what I would call process data would, that would come from your control system, typically coming out of the historian. And three of them are additional data that probably would come through IoT. And it's, I call it equipment data uh, that uh, normally is not in the process control system. Now you can extend this to your medium data. You know, if you, if you have, uh, you do this for one pump and let's say you have a process plant that has hundreds of pumps in it, you start applying it a broad based to uh, your algorithm to a bunch of pumps. And now you can start thinking of the medium data of, of uh, who's the best supplier and what's, what's the best practice for, for uh, maintaining that asset or maybe applying it. You know, where is a half horsepower needed uh, versus a, a, a one horsepower or 10 horsepower type of pump. Um, now, some of you are thinking is, it may be thinking for that, for that equipment data that I mentioned, you know, I go back a, a slide, this, this vibration, motor, uh, current, that data that you would pull out of the, the equipment, uh, geez, do I have to throw out all my equipment and get new equipment with, with uh, uh, IoT access? I'll just point out, and the bold ones are common uh, uh, data, that for at least two decades, uh, this equipment, you know, PLCs, for example, robots, SCADA systems, CNCs, for at least two decades or more, uh, these devices have had Ethernet ports on it that you could uh, connect to and communicate with and pull out equipment data. So uh, you should, the odds are your installed base of equipment has a lot of uh, pieces of equipment in it that you could communicate with directly. So now I'm, I'm just switching gears a little bit, talked about process data, equipment data. I'm just talking a little bit here now about the common path for implementation, all right? Now, typically the first step is to take data out of a historian, put it into an IoT platform. Usually that platform has very robust analytics. Uh, most platforms that I've looked at have, have at least 12 or so or more uh, analytics microservices for different types of analytics that you can do on that data. It can go any from everything from SPC type things uh, clear up to uh, uh, machine learning or uh, 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 other types of uh, uh, artificial intelligence that go on to that data. So you get very robust analytics and it, it's usually um, the interfaces have been made, particularly the IoT platforms that have been made for predictive maintenance and for use by control engineers or, or process engineers, those type of people, hopefully a lot of people who live listening to this. Uh, a lot of it is uh, the development has been simplified. So a lot of it is drag and drop. You, you drag in a, a data value into the uh, uh, analytics platform and it starts doing analytics on that data value. And the output is something that you uh, decide whether or not to do uh, generate alerts, right? Now, as you start to need equipment data, as you decide to make that, you know, if you get too many false positives, you, you will need to make the 
uh, analytics more robust. Uh, so people start to add uh, intelligent devices. Uh, this can be something like a direct connection to a robot or an existing PLC. Or in case of older equipment, you may wrap something around it. You may take a PLC. I would recommend the use of PLC because it's ruggedized. But uh, there are, are, are many other types of, of uh, uh, intelligent devices you can put on the plant floor. You wrap a... Uh, uh, a PLC around it, connect the PLC to the existing I.O., uh, you know, in a parallel connection to the control system. Uh, and that's one way to add equipment data. Uh, if the, the sensor you want isn't available, what people do is add Wi-Fi uh, or use existing Wi-Fi networks. A lot of plants nowadays have installed wireless uh, infrastructure, and you can just use that. Uh, the, the wiring can be extremely expensive and often just using Wi-Fi alone vastly reduce the cost of, of implementing the adding the equipment data to your, uh, to make your uh, analytics much more robust. Uh, this, uh, uh, and then you can also start thinking about adding uh, other data sources like weather, you know, stuff that's, that's available on the web or maybe data about humidity or facilities and, and, and stuff like that. So this is a common uh, implementation plan. Start with a historian, intelligent devices, wireless IO, and other sources like weather data. And you can make a very, very robust uh, analytics uh, with low false positives. Now, this here is just comparing two approaches. Uh, you know, in the past, people would add I.O. to the control system. Well, if you do that, because that I.O. could potentially use part of control, you have to make that very, very robust. And it can cost $10,000 to add a, a point. People have told me that when you uh, use something that is just purely monitoring, it gets a lot less expensive. Uh, you're not using it as part of the control system, so you can use wireless I.O. You can use less expensive sensors, uh, and it's typically only $1,000 to add a point and to uh, start doing uh, analytics on it. Uh, and another key point is those of you who are reliable in the engineers can now get control of your own destiny. Uh, because you can have a separate monitoring system. You don't have to beg the control engineers to add a point to their control system, which usually is problematic because they don't want to distract the control system from other things. Control should control the facility. Uh, you can have a separate monitoring system uh, that uh, you can then control your own destiny. Do predictive maintenance and alerts to prevent downtime. Now, just to go through the benefits for the manufacturer, first time fix rate. That should go down time because your predictive maintenance algorithm is giving you some sense of what the control, what the source of the problem is. For example, on a motor attached to a pump, if, if uh, the issue is vibration, the odds are you should send out a mechanic out there, uh, maybe some bolts need to be tightened that, uh, that, uh, or a bearing needs to be replaced or something like that. So the odds are you send out a mechanic. Uh, if the problem is with current drawer, the electric motor, uh, the odds are then you need to send an electrician out to evaluate what's going on there. So, you know, just right off the bat, instead of, you know, sending out somebody to do an inspection and then when you have a better understanding of the problem, send out the right skills, you can send out the right skills right, or right to begin with. Uh, so because you have some idea what the problem is, the first time fix rate should go way down. Uh, again, the me for the same reasons, the mean time to repair should go way down. And uh, mean time before failure. Now I'm defining a failure here as unplanned downtime, meaning that while production is using the piece of equipment, it breaks, it interrupts production, and you have a big business problem as a result. Your, your mean time before failure or unplanned downtime should go to near zero with a product, robust predictive maintenance program. Uh, and 
uh, that has tremendous amount of business benefits about preventing lost revenues, idle labor, lost uh, uh, work and process materials. Now, let's convert those benefits that I just mentioned into business benefit that a, a senior executive would uh, care about, including and particularly your chief financial officer. So we have a business benefit around uptime. Uh, if I convert that to, uh, I can easily convert that to revenue, meaning that the equipment is running. While it's running, it's making product, and that product it produces revenue. Uh, and if it goes down, and I'm talking about critical pieces of equipment, particularly ones that when they go down, they, they impact revenue, there's a clear business benefit for there that the CFO and, and CEO would, would uh, clearly identify with. Uh, the untimed shipment ones, if the equipment goes down, then uh, production misses schedules. You, often that results in missed shipments. And uh, customer satisfaction issue, which also in some industries can convert into uh, a revenue, lost revenue problem because the uh, customer goes to another supplier. Now, uh, particularly in the discrete industries, this can convert into uh, a whip inventory in reduction. One of the reasons you have work and process in inventory between two pieces of equipment is that if the upstream piece of equipment goes down, you can use that work and process inventory to continue to run the downstream pieces of equipment. Well, if the upstream equipment doesn't go down when it's needed anymore, you have near zero unplanned downtime, you can reduce the WIP inventory. Uh, uh, and that, of course, has a business benefit that falls into the balance sheet. With lower WIP inventory, that reduces uh, uh, or frees up cash, and it also reduces the inventory that's on the balance sheet. Uh, I'm going to combine this with asset longevity. Uh, with good predictive maintenance, your assets last longer, and that conserves cash, meaning you don't have to spend money to uh, buy replacement assets. Uh, and oh, by the way, when you're by that new asset, it's carried on the balance sheet at a very high value because it's brand new until it's depreciated. So an older asset that's already depreciated has a low value on the uh, balance sheet, now has a much higher value. So uh, the, the using of cash and the increase of assets, uh, uh, there are the financial items list on Wall Street, they use those numbers to do financial calculations. Uh, and if the, the, the cash is conserved and the assets are lower, those calculations look a lot better and the stock looks like it's much more valuable and the stock value goes up. So by, by increasing asset longevity and by having less WIP inventory, that has a direct impact on the value of the stock, which obviously has a business benefit to the C-suite. I'm not gonna go into the other ones, they're uh, uh, pretty obvious. I, I wanna now convert those two into return on assets, a key benefit uh, 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 metric tracked in the C-suite and also by financial analysts. If you improve uptime, improve revenue, you have more profit, that's in the numerator, uh, if you uh, uh, increase asset longevity and, and uh, reduce WIP inventory, that reduces assets. That's in the, the denominator. Uh, and the, you know, this is uh, math that we all learned when we were in grammar school. This isn't complicated. Uh, uh, by increasing the, the numerator and reducing the denominator, obviously both of those drive our way up which is a key, a key benefit. And that's how you get executive interest and executive support for your predictive maintenance applications. And I highly recommend that uh, you do not base your business case on reducing maintenance costs. I see that path is all too typically taken. 
The C-suite doesn't usually care that much about that. It's not enough to get their attention. And it then becomes difficult to get support for your predictive maintenance investments. If you instead take the approach of uh, uptime, asset longevity, profit, and assets, uh, it, be- it definitely gets uh, executive suite attention and it becomes much easier to get the resources you need to ensure success for your project. Those are the end user benefits. Let me talk about the benefits to an OEM for a moment. Uh, this takes a little different path. Uh, the OEM, uh, uh, we recommend the, the approach is to, uh, and these are for intelligent assets that already have a computer in them. Uh, that's when this works. Uh, even if it's just an engine control mo- module, which would be uh, this particular case. Cummings took the approach that they first started to taking data from the equipment. This is the first time development had access to real operating data from the field, and they used that to design a better product. Uh, this tested the infrastructure for data collection. Then the next step they took is they went to and they offered predictive maintenance services to their installed base. So the first part was to ins- increase the market share for the products to grow that revenue with, by designing better products. And the second step, the services increased revenue uh, by having a new product to offer their installed base. Uh, we find, by the way, that people go who directly go to services, skip this step, usually muck it up, make mistakes, and uh, really have to backtrack and it delays the program for a year or two if they ever can get their sales force attention again. Uh, we highly recommend that if you're an OEM, you do the data collection first and then go to offering services. Uh, this obviously uh, increases both a revenue dramatically and gets executive attention. For you end users out there, we highly recommend that you add viable IoT strategy to your equipment selection uh, criteria. Because if you choose a supplier that does not have a viable strategy, they are not going to be able to move up to this level. They're going to lose market share to somebody who does have a viable strategy. uh, And their long-term business success is very suspect. Now, to put this in another way for you OEMs out there, uh, this chart is your product life cycle charter. You know, uh, when you develop the product, you have a lot of sunk costs. When you sell the product, there is margin for the product. The area under the curve for margin is bigger than the area of the cur- curve for development. So you have some profitability. When you add IoT and predictive maintenance services, the area on the curve for revenue and profitability goes way up. Uh, and it's reasonable to expect over time that eventually this green area could be 50% of the firm's revenue. Much higher revenue, much higher margin, a much higher valuable company from a stock viewpoint. And that gets executive attention pretty damn quick. For government, this may look a little trivial, but it's, it's uh, based on the uh, uh, engagements I've had with uh, uh, government entities is much, um, uh, uh, is real. Uh, and I'll spend a little time just talking about the uptime one. Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, when a resident goes to turn on their tap water and, and nothing comes out or it's, it's pretty, pretty ugly stuff, uh, people get mad pretty quick. Or if they find out that when they flush their toilet, uh, the stuff went out to uh, ended up in a, in, a, in a river or in a lake, uh, they get pretty upset about that from an environmental impact viewpoint. So, you know, uptime for water treatment uh, becomes a, a, a critical factor to those voters. And you say much the same thing about power. If you have a lot of power outages or, or power quality problems, uh, you have a lot of ha- residents that are unhappy and people lose elections as a result of those kinds of issues. So PDM prevents those kinds of problems from having, 
happening, and your uh, elected officials are much more likely to be reelected if there's good infrastructure. So let me just talk about business process automation for a while, for a few minutes. Um, alerts that get generated need to go to somebody who can do something about it. So, you know, if an alert goes to somebody who's on vacation or, you know, the, the purchasing agent uh, who doesn't have any idea what to do with it, or some, uh, uh, somebody who's really not involved in maintaining equipment, those alerts, lost alerts, result in unplanned downtime, which is what you were supposed to prevent. So your project looks like it was a failure. Uh, our recommendation is that all those alerts go to somebody who's a maintenance planner, they can do triage, uh, prioritize them and generate uh, work orders accordingly. Uh, we talked about process data and then adding equipment data so you have a more robust application Again, those alerts need to go to somebody who can do something about them. That would be the planner in case of an end user. For implants, that would be the uh, inside a plant on, on site maintenance. That would be your, be your EAM. And in case of an OEM who has a field service management application, uh, that would be your field service management planner. Uh, they would go to work orders. We highly recommend you do use a mobile device. And the reason for that is if you do, you know, if you have paperwork orders, you have your, your data quality problem. And, uh, uh, but if you have your uh, mobile device, you can, as part of the data collection process, assure high data quality. Uh, and uh, then your, your uh, EAM and FFS system will become a trusted planning system. Um, and you know, just to talk about the mobile device, you can start adding uh, business process automation to it. And I'd use, uh, you know, your ride sharing applications as an example. You know, somebody will type in when they cross the line, they'll type in where they want to go. All right. But the application, your mobile device already knows where they're coming from because the mobile device provides the GPS location. So you can think of those kinds of things that are in your uh, mobile technician's mobile device to automate the business process. So, you know, in this case, uh, you know, there's some analytics. It finds a, uh, a driver that's in the area and asks the driver to accept it. The uh, driver confirms and, uh, you know, the driver already knows where you are within nine feet, knows where you want to go, and uh, uh, has a map to, to uh, take them to that correct location. So you can see, and of course, there's a lot more business process automation that goes in after this when you wanna pay, uh, uh, pay, pay for the drive uh, as an example. But the, you know, think about this as you start using that mobile device. And just quickly, I'll go through a couple of case stories. Um, uh, one in particular that I like a lot is the, the uh, uh, in this case, it was closing the doors. Number one, because it's simple. The IO that you need to know is how quickly the door closes. So it's simply when the door starts to close and when, it's, when it finally does close. So it's, it's two points and the time in between. And... Uh, uh, there's six doors on a train. So you, you develop the algorithm for one door and then repl replicate it for the six doors. And then uh, in this case, I think there are 800 uh, uh, trains. So, you know, you're covering uh, six times eight is you know, a lot of doors. Uh, but with that was with just one application development and, and huge benefits in terms of the trains running on time, because it turns out that the key reason a train doesn't run and I think it was like in 50% of the cases because one of the doors doesn't close. Uh, this one uh, I talked about, uh, just mentioned before, unplanned downtime. The compressor uh, is uh, when oil is pumped out, crude is pumped out, it needs to be separated, the water separated from the oil. Uh, the first step is a compressor to do that. Uh, and in, in, in this particular case, it was a, it was a rather robust algorithm that a, 
uh, a PhD developed uh, and uh, it was implemented and uh, it prevented uh, unplanned downtime or result. And uh, as a result, that uh, uh, platform could produce, could produce more oil and uh, uh, prevented instances. Uh, this case has to do with the uh, power transmission. Uh, uh, there's a huge installed base of uh, transformers, tens of thousands of, of transformers that are part, part of power transmission. And uh, uh, this uh, 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 ABB offers a, uh, uh, a remote condition monitoring. They now uh, uh, do remote condition monitoring for over a million transformers. And uh, this prevents unplanned downtime like was experienced uh, in, in one of my earlier slides. Uh, and uh, uh, here, Fisher Values Valves is, is offering a predictive maintenance uh, for the valves, that, their valves, and it, they offer that as a value-added service. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the end of time, uh, so uh, I won't go into more detail about those case stories. Uh, I kind of ran through them quickly, but the con conclu conclusions you should draw is unplanned downtime is avoidable with uh, good predictive maintenance. Uh, predictive maintenance is now affordable compared to the old custom projects, and it's sustainable because of a, an IoT platform and the microservices. Uh, so the data management and the uh, uh, IT infrastructure that you use to implement this is, uh, 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 is maintained by the IoT platform, and you don't have to do this. And the key thing is you reliability engineers out there uh, by using predictive maintenance and having a separate monitoring system separate from the control system can have control of your own destiny. Thank you for listening to me. And now I think we're ready for the Q&A. Well, thanks, Ralph, for a great presentation. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in a live Q&A session immediately following. Be sure and have your questions ready. Thanks for joining us. And we hope the information provided will suit your purposes.